Good morning, everyone. You're all very welcome to the third webinar in our series, Building Blocks for Scale. Today, we're going to be discussing how people and the culture of your organization are essential if you want to drive scale in your business. My name is Tom Early, and I lead the funding and scaling solutions team within Enterprise Ireland. The goal of which is to work with our clients to help them access appropriate funding to scale their business in a rapid and sustainable way. In last month's session, we discussed the importance of planning Paul O'D, of select strategies, who's written no less than three books on scaling your business. And we heard from Mark Barrett, CEO and founder of APC, who shared his phenomenal growth story with us. Now, during this session, Mark stressed the importance of people, of leadership and the culture of his company in the scaling journey. So this is a nice segue into today's webinar. In a moment, I'm going to hand you over to Karen Hernandez, the senior executive uh, in the leadership and scaling uh, department, or, sorry, in leadership and scaling in Enterprise Ireland. Uh, she's going to discuss how the people structure of your organization needs to change as your company grows and provide you with some practical advice on how to understand and address your company's growth needs, covering off how to handle some of the common challenges uh, that scaling companies face. And then we're going to be joined by Owen Leonard, CEO and founder of I3PT and OBI. And he'll take us through his company's scaling journey, particularly how he managed to achieve such rapid growth of like over 40% per annum uh, throughout the pandemic. So with that, I would like to welcome Karen onto the camera. So uh, Karen currently uh, is leading the agency's people and management team. She's supporting the SME growth and job creation. She's in this role, she regularly engages in one-to-one -one with companies uh, to support them in putting in plans, uh, you know, management structures, how to develop capability, the HR processes, all of which are aimed at driving growth. So Karen, you're very welcome. Hi, Tom. How are you? Good morning, everybody. Um, as Tom said, my name is Karen Hernandez and I lead Enterprise Ireland's uh, People and Management Pillar. Um, and our focus in the pillar is to work with companies to help them put in place the right organizational structures, HR processes and capability across the organization so that they can scale successfully. Um, we work with companies and management teams across all sectors and all stages of growth really to help them understand and address their organizational growth challenges. And that's what I'll be talking to you about over the next 10 minutes, um, about the importance of reviewing and evolving your organization to support you to sustain or to scale in a sustainable manner. So um, next slide there, Aoife. Um, so we know from our research that companies tend to follow distinct phases of growth. Um, and as a, as a company grows, its organizational structure, its practices, its capability need to evolve to support this growth. And you'll see from, from this image here, which is taken from um, research carried out by Churchill and Lewis, um, that companies start out really with a very simple reporting structure. Uh, and obviously as company grow, um, as a management team is brought on board, as um, uh, staff numbers increase, this um, um, structure becomes increasingly complex. Um, HR and people processes are normally quite uh, informal at early stages of growth. Um, and then as employee numbers grow, as management numbers grow, they tend to become more formalized because what you want is um, consistency across teams and across um, managers. Um, and the role of the owner um, and the business manager also changes as, as a company evolves and grows through various stages of growth. Um, while at the very, very early stages of a business, the, the founder or owner manager or CEO is very much integral to every single part of the business. Um, that role has to change as the company grows. And um, that's when, you know, we see the, the emergence of, of that kind of leadership role um, from a CEO perspective where the, the CEO and management team focus um, on driving the business rather than working on the operational activities. So next slide, Aoife. Um, so at Enterprise Ireland, we've developed an organizational development framework, um, and we use this when we support our clients across all stages of growth and sectors to transition through their own um, various stages of growth. Um, we call it the 3C frame framework, 
and it focuses on three specific areas that we know from research and experience both in Ireland, in Europe and globally that we know are critical to, to a company's growth. Um, so from um, looking at the first um, area, we, this is clarity of direction. And this is really important for a company that's scaling is to be able to communicate your evolving vision, your purpose and strategy. And this is going to, to change um, as your company grows. Um, your culture, your values and behaviors, companies will start to look at um, how to maybe formalize some of these aspects because it's very easy to have a culture when you're an early stage company but how do you how do you keep that culture how do you maintain those values and those important behaviors that make your company unique um, as that company grows maybe from 30 to 50 to to 100 um, plus employees um, and setting clear goals and deliverables are really important that everybody, not only your management team, but everybody in the organization um, is able to understand their role within the business and where, um, I guess, where they contribute um, to, to the business goals. Um, again, at each stage of growth, you'll be looking at various aspects of this. And this is one of the areas where Enterprise Learning can support you to evolve. Um, from a coordination perspective, that's the second area of importance, and this is looking at your structure. So as we saw from the previous slides, your structure is going to evolve as your company grows. Um, you might need um, to bring on new skills in the management team, um, various strategic roles within the business as the company grows. You'd also need to bring in some HR systems and processes really to, to help um, engage and motivate employees. And this could be anything from um, the way you, you recruit and manage employees to how you set performance goals. Um, and just moving on from, from that performance across the business, obviously, is really, really important and critical as the company scales. Um, and linking back to the previous um, previous theme, which is clarity of direction, having clear goals and deliverables and having some processes around how these goals and deliverables are set and managed um, and individuals and performance is, is, is managed is really, really important. Um, and the final area we look at is um, capability. And this is looking at how your, your leadership and your management um, capability needs to evolve as your company grows. And this could be bringing in board members, some non-exec directors, could be looking at um, gaps in the leadership team, um, how to shift a mindset from a manager to a leader, um, identifying addressing um, gaps across the business, and also attracting, managing and um, developing talent at all levels of the business. So we find this framework really useful in helping us really understand where a company's at in terms of where they are today and also helping them plan um, into the future. Um, so next slide there, Aoife. Um, so again, why, why would we use um, why would we use a framework like this to support companies? Um, it's really important because using a framework like this allows you to examine every single part of your organization that's going to impact on your growth. It allows you to look at the current situation that you have at the moment, whether it's fit for purpose, um, but it also allows you to plan for your future state. So what your organization might look like 18 months, three years, five years down the line. Um, and we do have a HR um, manager or a HR function, um, it's often very useful to bring them on board so that they can really understand what actions you need to take to move from your current organizational state to your future state. And very often that's encapsulated within a HR strategy. Um, and the whole um, idea behind this shift in organizational state is to help you build the right organization that's going to help you achieve your, your strategic growth objectives. Um, so next slide, Aoife. So I thought it might be useful just to pull up some of the common OD challenges that we see with scaling companies. Um, very often what we see is there needs to be a mindset shift, um, particularly where there's an owner manager and a, and a senior team that's been there since the company um, um, has been established. Um, very often there needs to be 
um, it's difficult for managers to shift themselves from the operational into, into the leader. And I think maybe Owen might be um, give us some insight on that when we speak to him in a few minutes time. Um, accessing external expertise to grow the business. This is really important. This doesn't have to always be bringing people in to your senior team. It can be accessing consultants. It can be bringing in non-exec directors. But really what you're trying to do is to is to, to gain as much knowledge as possible from external expertise and, and bring that in to help you as a leader, um, I guess, uh, uh, evolve and um, execute on your strategy. Um, one of the probably the most common challenges that we see is, is, is companies needing to evolve their structure and their roles. Um, because sometimes a structure will get you to a certain place, but it won't be the right structure that will help you achieve your, your growth strategy into the future. So you might have some, some role gaps, for example, a CFO or COO or CTO, HR function might need to come on board at various stages of growth. And again, looking at the evolution of HR practices, um, as a company grows, you will need to evolve, say, your performance management. You might need to uh, bring in some consistency around how people are managed, how line managers, um, the, 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 the way that in which they engage their staff. Again, um, this is something where very often a HR manager that comes on board at a certain point in time will help you execute on. Um, attracting and retaining talent has always has been a it's been a challenge for companies over the last uh, three to four years, certainly, and certainly since COVID. Um, again, this has been identified in the latest CIPD research as the most, um, I suppose, common challenge across Irish companies today. Um, um, again, is looking at how do you how do you continue to. Um, I guess, sell yourself as, as an attractive proposition to candidates and how then do you engage and uh, motivate um, individuals once they're, once they're in um, working with yourselves. Um, identifying and addressing skills gaps as your company grows, you will find that there will be skills across the business. It may be at the management team and it may well be in other areas of the business and maybe you're accessing a new market or maybe you're moving into a different um, kind of production area where you might need to bring gaps, uh, where you might need to fill gaps. And um, very often companies will need to sit down and really look at their strategy, look at their existing skills and where those gaps are and identify whether or not those skills gaps can be addressed either through recruiting or through development of existing staff. Um, and finally here, just pulled out succession planning. Um, obviously for family businesses, this has always been critical. Um, and for other businesses, again, it's very important to understand who are the next leaders of your organization? Who are those individuals who are gonna help you build um, and scale um, and identifying those at a very early stage and making sure that those individuals are managed, um, retained and developed within your business. Um, and so just the final slide, Aoife. So I won't go through these questions one by one, but I put them up here because I think at some point it is important every year, every 18 months to sit down and reflect on your business. Um, at each stage of growth you're at, do you have the right skills? Do you have the right um, um, managers? Do you have um, the right processes in place to take you to the next stage of growth? Um, and just maybe just looking at one of them here, the leadership strategic and functional skills, we would encourage you to really sit back um, and maybe have a conversation with your DA around um, how Enterprise Ireland can support you in developing your skills throughout the business and making sure you have the right leadership in place, you have the right um, skills on your, your, your board if you have one, um, you have the right functional skills, um, and if you don't have them internally, how, how can we support you then to build those skills and how can we support you to recruit um, externally? So, um, Tom, I think I've just hit the 12 minute mark there. So um, I might hand back to you. And obviously there we've time for questions um, in, in towards the end of the webinar. I'm happy to take them then. Thanks, Karen. That, that was excellent. So um, 
uh, so Karen's going to be joining us again, as she just said, at the end of the session. So if you have any questions, just put them into the Q&A function and we'll go through them. So now I'd actually like to invite Owen Leonard, uh, the CEO and founder of i3PT. And Owen, I'm going to ask you to start off and actually just explain uh, what your companies do. Maybe you might just give us a, a little bit of an overview. Yeah, hi Tom. Um, so just uh, i3PT and Obi, uh, just to explain what we do, i3PT is a professional services business and we work with major property funds, investors, multinational corporations, and we work with them on their buildings. And our primary role is to make sure that whatever they build is more sustainable and safe and, and performs as intended. So we provide technical advice during design, build and, and operation of buildings. And ESG, which is the, the sustainability arm of our business, is, is growing really, really quickly. Um, I would say it's probably one of the fastest growing uh, parts of our business. Um, and that, that we do that pretty much across Europe. Um, on the OB side of the business, that's our software arm. So it was something that emerged as part of our professional services businesses originally. And it's kind of an age old story where we develop software to deliver our own services. And then we got to a point where clients started asking about it and, and looking to, to purchase it. Um, and being the great businessman that I am for years, I said, no, no that's not really our model. Uh, we don't we don't sell software. And about, I think, four or five years ago, we kind of bit the bullet and we said, OK, we, we built something really special here and we should try to do it service. So we built a, a full team around that. And and now Obi, uh, as it's called, is is our, our SaaS model. And it's it's a, it's another part of our business. Um, so, yeah, as I, as I speak about this a little bit today, Tom, we have two I suppose business areas, one which is professional services and one which is software, which are related in terms of what they do, but they're they're quite different in terms of demographics, in terms of the 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 nature of the um the workforce and everything else. Um, and that that's probably a, a rich ground for discussion. Um and and but I, I would I would say in our professional services side, there's also two parts to that ESG and, and technical advisory. Okay. Well, just on that, right? Okay, because during if I look at at your numbers, uh, I saw that well, between twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two, you managed to achieve a forty percent forty six percent increase in in your revenue line, and actually that was based off a big increase on the year before and a big increase on the year before that. And I'm kind of wondering, how did you actually manage to achieve that? And, and, and maybe it's my naivety here, but I would have thought providing services into the construction industry during the pandemic when everything was closed down and that you still achieve phenomenal growth. Yeah, so I guess with that, um, in those two years, um, our industry was really hit quite hard in the sense that I think approximately 47 of our projects were actually paused uh right. nothing happening on site for approximately eight to nine months uh, obviously that happened in waves uh, three months four months and three months or whatever it was in time uh, at the time in terms of lockdowns so the um i suppose the was we grew in that period of time to grow in that period we had to work four times as hard as we would have had to do in any other year to achieve that level of growth right and when i say we i mean everybody um i think when the first lockdown happened um my I suppose my, my immediate sense was doom. You know, we're we're really we're really in trouble here. You know, how the hell are we going to keep trading, let alone growing? You know, so um, and when I get bad news like that, I usually go into a, a, a terrible negative spin for about twelve hours, and I you know I, I catastrophize everything, and I, and then I sit down, and I start writing down a bit of a plan. But I'm lucky these days in that we have a lot of people in the company that can plan with me. Right, we have a really really strong executive leadership team that's grown over the years. Some people have been with us for. 10 years some people have been with us for two some people joined last year right but but i think the, the thing at the time was i became really acutely aware that the need to communicate regularly was 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 a big thing i had to talk to people almost every week to let them know what was going on because was i might have been catastrophizing things i think everybody in the company was also thinking well is this me does this mean my job is going to go or, or what's going on here right so where's the company at financially all that good stuff right so we were pretty radically transparent uh, really quickly in terms of saying to everyone this is where we're at you know we, we 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 can weather this first one no problem but we may need to 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 pull everything out of the bag here and, and be aggressive about growth because my my sense of these things um we we grew up in a recession so i founded the company and 2012 but we had really started running or started pulling the business together in 2010 so we kind of grew out of a recession right mm -hmm. and the one thing I, I knew from that was that if you try to hold your own in a downturn or you try to hold your own and in, in in the lockdown it was worse than the downturn effectively people were faced with a situation where the tap was just turned off right yeah. um there was no time to plan um 
but in those situations, if you try to absorb it and, and, and hold your own, you go backwards, right? So we came up with the idea that we were going to take all of these ideas that we had on the shelf because we were doing a lot of innovation work on the software side and we we're doing a lot of work on ESG and other things that were pet projects that were kind of, you know, maybe in a couple of years. We just pulled all of those things forward and we said, right, we're going really aggressively after these right now, right? Everything that we had in the back burner is coming forward and we're developing it quickly and we're going to make sure that we can actually uh, bring this to market as fast as we can. And that was really, really important. And actually, that's where all of our growth came from during that period, right? So we we did start to export more. We did start to uh, bring new products and services to the market. Um, we grew in terms of headcount. We grew in terms of turnover both years. It was really challenging. I think probably the most challenging period of my professional life, uh, considering that I, I'd set the company up in a in the construction industry in 2010. That'll tell you something, because mm. when you go looking for money in 2010, and, and everything in the news cycle is saying that nothing is going to be built for another 15 years. People look at you like you're crazy, you know, so you're, you're, you're to say that COVID was harder says a lot, um, but it was also probably the best period of my professional life. And I think the the culture in our organization was, was, was incredible. When it came to the fore. It was just um, the number of people who would contact you in the evenings and say, listen, is there something I can do here? I've got a friend over here who's working in this business and I think we can kind of maybe break in here. Everybody in the company was a salesperson within a very short period of time. And the software team, who were many of whom were quite new, were pulling stuff out of the bag that we had never seen. And, and you know, they were, yeah, it was just, I think, a special time for me. Uh, and I remember saying at the time that if we get through this and if we can grow, you know, whatever comes after this is going to be easy, right? Because you're never, <laughs> never going to face that kind of challenge again. And this year, we'll grow by 48, 50% again, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll double the growth that we did in the previous years, you know? So... Yeah, I think it just set us up for um, more success, I think, you know. Yeah, well, I, I do know that, that I suppose that's one of the things, uh, you know, with startups and early stage companies that uh, you, you know, you, you can repivot and you can galvanize everybody and, and do it together because there's, you know, there's so few years and, and it's great. But like you're 112 people. So and like, the, you, you know, you're, you're practically Dublin over the years there. So I mean, how did you actually manage to motivate and drive everybody in towards this growth um, agenda? I, I think a key point actually was when you think about the growth that we had, um, we didn't have any sales or marketing people in the business until three years ago, right? So all right. of the growth here was really interesting. We, we did, I think David Wallace joined us as our chief commercial officer almost four years ago now. He was the first person to come into the company with an exclusively sales role. And we didn't have any real marketing function until a year and a half ago almost, right? When when Raymond Coppinger joined us as our chief marketing officer. And uh, and it was funny, you know, I think we, we first, yes, was the growth came from our reputation for quality. Genuinely, I think yeah, I can say that with, my hand on heart. I think we're we're the best at what we do. You know, I really believe that. I think we we put more into it than anybody else in our space. I think we we we're really really passionate about what we do, which is making the built environment greener and safer, right? And I think it's mm -hmm. a mission that people can get behind. But I think the key thing is when you look at how do we grow. If people join the company and they believe in it, and I think the people who join our company really do, and they're into it, um, you see that in them every day when they're out doing their jobs, and people talk about us, and then. Like we picked up Facebook as a client in Ireland when we were quite small. I think we were less than 10 people. And they contacted us about a 700 million euro data center. And we, we said, look, we're not, we're, not, we're not all that big, actually, just yet. You know? um, and I said, no, well, your reputation is, is really good. We've spoken to people who've worked with you guys, and, and we'd like to work with you. you know? So it was, a, it, was that, it was that kind of, um, I think, the, the culture as well as the Amsterdam. The culture in the, in the company was strong. People sensed that they, they they bought into our people and then they bought into us and then we grew, right? And I think when the people in the company were passionate about what we do, what they what they do and what we do, they would talk to other people about it. And, and I think it was more um doing than saying, right? So we weren't marketing hard. It was just people were watching what we we're doing and saying, we need to get those guys in. Now, I will say that works in Ireland, right? That works in Ireland because we're small and we have the IDA and we have EI and we have these incredible institutions that support us to grow, right? But also yeah. we have they bring in this incredibly sophisticated demand like Facebook, like Amazon and these companies that we can get to work with, right? Uh, so we have this incredible ecosystem for, for entrepreneurs in our company, I think. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not just saying that because you've invited me on it. I <laughs> uh, yeah. But I mean, it, it, it was it's, it's a unique advantage, right? There's almost nowhere else in the world where a company with 10 employees could take on that kind of work and, and be supported to get to the next phase and then pick up another client like that, right? So I would say the one thing that that early period did for us, which was a negative, uh, if you can pick it as a negative, is we probably um, 
we probably had a flawed business model, which is we didn't have a sales and marketing function. And then when we tried to export what we did, you know, it just didn't work as easily. We, we needed to have the structures and the systems and, and the various other things in place. So I think we kind of got a little bit fat and happy over here thinking we're the best. So, you know, we don't need to do very much. Uh, it's all going to come to us, right? Yeah. Uh, when, when you step off the plane in London where I am today and you, you meet people, you tell them what you did in Ireland, it doesn't always travel. You know, you, you have to be in the market and you have to be doing things here for them to think that you're serious. So I think that was probably a big lesson learned for us when we were trying to work in Europe and, and, and in, in the EU and, and working in London um, or the UK. I, I think uh, we needed to have those structures in place to grow properly over here as well, you know. Okay, you're touching on a couple of things that I, I'm going to uh, have to come back and ask you about. But I, I suppose one of the, and maybe it's a personal one for you, right? So in your own personal role, I mean, you went from, you know, managing a small number of people to now you're leading quite a large team. I mean, how did you go about transitioning yourself or, or did you transition yourself? I mean, did you change your style? How, how did you go yeah, about this? I think pretty subtly, um, Tom, right, in the sense of, the nature of the organization and the people we have, especially the traditional business, uh, we, we always had very experienced people in the company. So we, we never had a lot of junior people, right? And, and the people who came into the business uh, were more knowledgeable in their area than I was, right? So we had structural engineers or chartered engineers that were joining the business and, and knew much, much more about their area of the business than I did. I had to get comfortable very early on with the idea that I'm not going to be the authority uh, on certain things. And I have to lead in a different way, right? So I, I suppose I never... We never had a command and control type of business. There was always a relatively flat structure. And there was a concept of, of people leading through subject matter expertise. And that made a lot of sense for us because if somebody was a senior person in our business and they were engaging on a half a billion of real estate, right? They had to have a lot of leadership quality. They had to be able to go outside of our offices and lead in the field. And you can't lead in the field um, and then come back in and count out to me because I'm the CEO. So the authority in my position in everything other than running the business is, 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 is something that I, I would be uh, careful about, right? So I, I don't try to trample on, on on what those guys are doing. To a large extent, I, I hire really good people and I trust them to come up with the systems. I, I might get involved in the governance and the structures and the rigor around how that gets set up and how it gets managed, but I've always been really comfortable with stepping back from stuff I'm not really good at. And I think the reason I bring that up is as we progress through the business over the years, as when David Wallace came in to take over the sales and marketing side of things, I, I was able to step back because I was used to doing that when uh, we brought in Jack, uh, uh, Deneen and, and Vicky to help run the software business, I was really quick to step back and allow them to grow on the roles, right? So I suppose I was always pretty comfortable with um, stepping back. Uh, I think where the big change has been with me in the last little while, I, I would put a lot of it down to leadership for growth, which I did last year. I think the biggest change in me has been, um, you know, I, I spend less time problem solving. I think when you're the CEO, whatever little problems arise, you you know, especially in a flat structure, you're probably the only person people can escalate stuff to, right? Mm. And, and the funny thing about that and the people that the thing that most CEOs want to admit is that it feels good to fix things, right? It feels great because you're the you're the kind of white knight. You can kind of, you know, swan in, fix everything, and everyone goes, Jesus is great, and, and you feel great, right? But if you're spending half your time doing that, you're not really thinking about the next stage, you're not thinking about um where you need to be going next and you're probably not spending enough time with your senior team you know you're not spending enough time with the executive leadership team i think when i came back from one of the sessions with leadership for growth last year um i realized i had to jot down how much time i was spending on different things and i reckon it was half of my time was on problem solving that that's been a big shift right so i spend a lot of time with the executive leadership team now so i spend time with Ray and Dave on the growth side of the business. I spent time with Lola, our chief people officer, who will speak about in a bit as well on the um, on, on the human resources and the organizational development. You know, so I, I'm I'm probably focusing more on being really clear to them in terms of what I want to do. And I think as Mark Randolph, he's the he's the guy who set up Netflix. I think he had a great phrase about what CEOs should do. He said. He said, the CEO has three jobs. He said, set the direction for the company, uh, pick the team to get you there and don't run out of money, right? And mm -hmm. those are my kind of guiding principles. But uh, but yeah, I would say I would say uh, one big thing for me at the moment where I'm spending probably most of my time is, is focusing on, on two things, clients and spending more time with them. So I spend maybe 50% of my time with clients or speaking with clients and, and with our growth team uh, to, pl to plot our growth and, and how we're going to get there. And trying to understand what it is that they see in us and how they value us, right? And the other side of my time, uh, a lot of my time is spent with Lola and looking at the organizational development plan because we need two things to grow, right? Really, we need two things. We need, we need really good clients who are going to believe in us and, and grow with us. 
but we also need really good people because we're so dependent on that right and you know the employee value proposition that we create right which is a fancy way of saying what's it like to work here right what kind of an experience are we giving people i'm really focused on that it puts a lot of, i put a lot of time into that actually i think about it a lot and, and i think yeah so th those things for me you know set the direction i need to be really clear about that and i need to be really clear with Ray and Lola and Jur and, and Cormac and all the guys in the senior team so that when they come to me I can give them really clear direction and I spend time with them and I make sure they know what I'm looking for uh, because I wasn't always good at that I think I, I assumed that everybody just extracted the ideas from my head through osmosis and it, you know just by <laughs> passing me yeah. the whole way you'd figure out what I was thinking you know it just doesn't work yeah. like no 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 uh, well actually just on that whole the, the, that whole piece that you're talking about because one of the things that I often come across companies is that they just they don't know what they don't know right and and you know it's uh you know i'll often come across the company and and, and i like on in and say well geez your your finance function like you, where's the the kpis where's the data how are you measuring this and then they realize when i've started posing the questions to them oh actually yeah i've got a massive gap here and i need to resource it and like how do you how did you realize or how did you go about realizing that you were missing these gaps and the skills or or the knowledge within your own organization it's some some of it's just obvious um tom i guess i guess one of the things that um is unusual within our company is because there is a slightly flat structure or i think a pretty flat structure uh we don't necessarily have a traditional organizational model it's not that we've done anything completely crazy but because of the the the, the large number of very senior people we, we don't have a very hierarchical structure right so okay there isn't a very command and control type of thing so when you look at a normal org chart there's a lot of roles that you you'd immediately pick and you say well i need those things right i think in in our company actually we were traditionally quite light on um general management so we didn't have a hr function as such and weirdly we were doing some really really good things with great retention right and everything else uh we were doing some really really good things that were kind of at the next level so we had like um we have gyms in the offices and we have a, a trainer, a strength and conditioning guy who works with the staff. He's on staff with us, right? So he works with the guys, give them programs. We're really big on the well-being thing. So we're getting full marks for that. We had, uh, you know, executive coaching. So people had quarterly executive coaching sessions. You know, we're getting like great marks for that as well in, in our heads, right? But we didn't have, um, we didn't have a, an employee handbook and we didn't have a proper reward and recognition system. So the funny thing again, and I go back to, what I said earlier about our revenue model was great in Ireland and our, our, our business model was great in Ireland, but it doesn't export unless you, you've got the right structures. I would also say our HR model on the surface, fantastic, right? Really good culture. Everyone buys in, everyone's mucking in together. Roles and responsibilities were really unclear. Now, and we kept bumping into little problems with that, right? Nothing major, nobody was leaving, but it was leading to frustration. And, and I was the only person who could resolve it because there was nobody else in the org chart you could speak to. So things like that were really obvious. And when I was on the Leadership for Growth program, I was sat over in New York, I think it was, and they went through this uh, HR model with us and they said, you need a strategic partner in HR. You need somebody who's not just doing the day-to-day, -day, you, know, um, you know, cover your backside stuff on HR, right? Which is, I think, how most people in the room thought about HR. Mm. You need actually plotting and managing and, and, and has a vision for the organization and where it's going to grow. What does the organization model look like? What are the roles you need, right? So I didn't have a lot of clarity around that. I knew I needed a sales and marketing function because it was bloody obvious, right? Mm. We didn't have those people. And, and we knew we needed a CFO at some point when we're really recruiting for that role now. But we didn't have, there was a lot of stuff we didn't have. And it was only when I got Lola, our chief people officer on board, um, you know, there was a phrase that I picked up over in New York. They said, on the HR side of things, you know, hearts and minds can be quite easy, especially for, uh, if, if you're a good communicator, hearts and minds is really easy, Right. But hands are necessary. And, and this had been something I bumped up against a few times on my side. I had these great ideas for the organization model of what I wanted to do and how we could be innovative with that because I really wanted to innovate with the organization model. I wanted to unlock the potential of the people that we had, but I kept bumping up against little problems. I wasn't able to execute. And, and what it was, was uh, this guy said in New York, he said, you need hearts and minds and hands. You need people who can put hands on this and make it happen. And I didn't have that person until Lola joined. And she's been transformational uh, for our business in terms of, I think, people in the organization meeting her and understanding that she's a very serious person who knows her business. She's, she's really, really good, you know, unrivaled academically in this area, knows a million times more than I do about it, you know. And I think 
from my point of view, I feel really comfortable. There's so much to do. We have so much we need to do, uh, you yeah. know, to take out of the, the trend and, and to, to do all the right things we want to do. We have so many plans, but I've never felt better about knowing about all these problems, right? Because I know that we have a team that can kind of start to put that together, you know? Um, and it's, sorry, it, it is when you talk about the hands there, is that, I mean, you're, you're basically talking, it's not just the ideas, but it's actually the implementation of the ideas. And that's what the, the hands element relates to, isn't it? It is. It, I think it's exactly that, uh, Tom, because I think it's no different than any other part of your strategy, right? Like mm. it's so easy to write a strategy. It, it isn't easy, but it's not. It's not hard, right? Like yeah, we can all read a business book. You know, we can all read. You know, uh, grab a template and crack on and write a strategy, right? And and by and large, it'll probably be okay. Uh, but most strategies, you know, um, they they fall down at the implementation phase, right? And it's because you don't have the right people on board. You don't have the clarity around who needs to do what. You don't have a clear understanding of the challenges, right? And I think yeah. There's things like that, that when we sat down at the beginning of this year and we started to plot out our HR plan, we had a bunch of stuff we wanted to do. And by Q2, Lola and I sat down and she said, these three things are coming out, right? Because we're not going to get it done. We just don't have the bandwidth, right? Mm. I think just having that realism as well of saying, right, we're not we're not going to just try to do everything here quickly and then make a mess of it. We're, we're going to do this in the right way. Uh, and we're, go- we're not going to announce things and then and then miss our deadlines. You know, we'll be, okay. we'll be uh, more steady about it, you know? So... Mm. Yeah, uh, uh, and, and then so so maybe you just touched on the the, the the challenges so what challenges or key people challenges do you see as as you continue to scale actually just scratch the people part or like challenges full stop across yeah. your organization starting with the people side right um i think we I mentioned this employee value proposition we're growing quickly we're going to grow really quickly again next year so the plan for us between um the professional services business and the SaaS business both are going to grow pretty exponentially over the next few years and we've got a really good plan for doing that we're really clear about how we want to do it but to do it we're going to need brilliant people like we're not just going to need thumbs on seats we need really good people that can maintain that culture and keep it going because you know arriving in milan as we have done and not having a, if we didn't have a great person there you know i'd be concerned about the first experience of our customers in that market or doing barcelona you know you need local people ideally people who speak the language and know the culture but mm. also so the employee value proposition is really, really important to us. We're really focusing on that and getting that right. That's our, our biggest challenge, I think, in terms of competing with international uh, companies for, for this type of talent, uh, but also maintaining that culture as we do it. So how do you go from 120 to 200, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, still have that sense, that feeling of togetherness and, and, and everything that we have. Not easily done, uh, but we're really dedicated to trying to do it, right? And I'm not saying we're going to get it right all the time. I th- yeah. I think the other thing is actually the fact that I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, we have three companies in one really, right? You know, I think sometimes people, when they try to have a, a software business and a services business, they don't recognize that they're very different, right? They're different in terms of the way they work. Mm-hmm. Different, you know, software is more hierarchical actually by nature, not necessarily hierarchical, but more structured, right? There is a little bit more um, control and, and, and more command in the way they do things because everything is to order, everything is specified down to the last detail, right? So yep. you can't have that same level of autonomy in your day-to-day in, in that business. So how do we square that circle as a business? How do we make sure that we understand that we've one company here, we've got the same set of core values, but actually when you apply those values, the behaviors are going to be different, right? The desired behaviors of the software team, when we're talking about something like doing the right thing, are going to be very different to a structured engineer who's overseeing uh, construction sites or, or, or new property, right? So mm. I think just that recognition that we have different demographics, we have different um, types of work, different ways of working, um, and making sure that we we have a model that actually uh, reflects that and takes care of it. I think beyond that, it's it's a um, uh, if it's not the people thing, I, I think it's just funding and making sure that we're we're funding the growth the right way. I think we we came from an era of bootstrapping the business. You know, there's a time, and, and I, I'm guilty of this, there's a time to bring money in. There's a time to either raise debt or equity or whatever it might be, you know, but to increase your working capital. Uh, because if you grow too quickly, and this is for any high growth companies that are out there, it was something we learned in, in Barcelona on the, the leadership for growth. If you grow too quickly and your working capital isn't growing quickly enough, right, if you're not increasing... Yep as your need of funds is, is raising and raising they call it they call it being in the jaws of the crocodile right uh, where at a point in time you're going to overtrade you're going to put yourself in a bad yeah. growth can be great your your profit and loss can be absolutely booming but your balance sheet can explode and kill your company right and i think as a ceo if i hadn't sat in on those sessions last year i probably wouldn't have been able to articulate the challenge that was coming down the tracks for us if we didn't fund the model appropriately right so yeah. that's a big one for us as well making sure we fund things appropriately and 
Yeah, uh, was kind of become really important for us. So you're you're, you're speaking stuff to, to my mind there now. Like, a, yeah, I've seen far too many companies sort of seizing opportunities and unfortunately, you know, walk themselves into serious trouble with overtrading. But what I might do is just invite Karen to to join us as well. We're getting a number of questions in, so I'm going to uh, open it up a little bit to the, the, the floor now in a second. Um, but and um, maybe a provocative way of asking this question, because you've mentioned it a couple of times about values and you mentioned it about the culture of the organization. And, you know, I mean, you know, you know, is that just a bit of fluffy stuff that that's come in? I mean, or is it really important? Do you really think that it's made a difference? For me? Um, uh, yeah. Is that, is that, is that yeah, me? for you, for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, look, on the, the value side of things, there was always something we were strong on, but I think um, in terms of, ex uh, of this, before Lola joined, I think we had 14 values written down, right? That's way yeah. too many, right? So I think, um, you know, because we were, I felt it was really important to be very specific, uh, you know, and it was really specific. The difficulty with being super specific and having 14 core values is that you can drop the core, they're just values, you know, there's too many of them and people can't remember them. Um, and I, I kind of used to question that thinking, you know, I was saying, well, why do we pick an arbitrary number like four or five? You know, we should just be really clear about what we mean. But people only have so much capacity to remember that stuff, right? And I think yeah. you needed to be clear and distill it down. So I think it's always been really important to us. It's a core driver in the business, no doubt. And um, yeah, it, it's been, it's something you can go back to um, when certain behaviors are, are, are not in keeping with what you're you're saying you do, you know? So I think where it's most useful, Tom, is where you have a really talented person in the company who's doing a really good job. But yeah. one, of our, one of our core values is being a great teammate, right? Being a great teammate. And we were able to recently, a little while ago, uh, look at that with somebody and say, look, you're really, really good at what you do. You're, you're a super performer. You know, you, you make a positive change in the world. Everything you do externally here is great. But internally, you know, the way you speak to your colleagues might be great. You know, you could do better here because that's a okay. core value for us. It's just mm -hmm. as just as important as the other ones, right? Mm -hmm. um, and having a good balance with the values is important. I, I think one of the things we came across when we were on the course was um, there has to be uh, there has to be coherence between what you say, what you do, what you prioritize, what you measure. If those four things don't connect, right? if you say one thing but then you prioritize it, you reward other behaviors, you know, people are going, well, those values don't really mean anything. You know, you have. Mm -hmm. I think as a, as a CEO in the company and in any company, if you write those things down, you need to be prepared to have them thrown at you, right? And I had it last year. I had a, I had a colleague, one of my colleagues, uh, who was a great guy, uh, turned around to me at one point last year and said, I hate to say this, but I don't think you're being a good teammate. And I was like, yeah, jeez. Having yeah, I mean, your own values thrown in your face. <laughs> yeah, he said, he said, he said, you've, not, you've not been clear with me here. You've not yeah. told me. You've not told me what my role is in this. And I feel like you're being a bad teammate, you know? And I was, my, my initial reaction was, what the hell, you know, yeah, it's really kind of like, my, I was emotional when I first read it. And then I was like, sit on this one for, for a day and think about what he's saying. And, and, and then right back, we had a really good chat afterwards. And and I, I to your point, you asked earlier, what, how has my style changed? Moments like that time were massive. It just, when you have to look at yourself and you say, you know, it never occurred to me before last year that I could be the thing that stops the business from growing or progressing or reaching its potential, right? Uh, that might be hubris. I'm not sure what it is. but No, that's actually a very huge insight, actually, because it, 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 I see it myself at the different stages of growth of companies that it's, it, it can sometimes be the founders are very good at getting them to a certain level, but just making them into the next stage can be the problem. Yeah. Uh, and Karen, I might just jump in there because we're getting a couple of different ones uh, in here. Like, so, so people are asking, you know, at what point should you consider hiring a HR manager? Uh, looking at this sort of stuff. Yeah. So, I guess it it depends on the sector you're in. Um, typically, we would say any company over fifty employees really should be seriously thinking about um, building HR practices. Um, and supports and that's really the time where you bring somebody in but increasingly we're seeing companies of maybe 20 30 individuals um, bringing HR managers in at a very early stage and this is really as just to go back to what Owen said is really to build the foundations and to get those right from the very very start um, and then that will I suppose ease that journey of growth for the company if those practices um, the foundations are there um, from the very beginning so um, you know some companies will be fine with 80 90 particularly if they're maybe on the manufacturing side I guess where we're, they tend to be a little bit later but certainly where companies are experiencing challenges with attracting retaining talent we're seeing HR manager coming in at an earlier stage than we we would have seen before 
Uh, and Owen, then there's a related question here and is asking, well, well, how many are in your HR team now currently? I mean, is it just Lola or is it huge no. plans to come? Yeah, uh, there's 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 a we, we, we joke at the moment. It's it's a one and three quarters or one and a half at the moment. So we're, one of the people in the operations team, actually, Jen, who's uh, who, who always had an interest in this area, was always involved, is working directly with Lola on it. Um, we're also looking at later on this year, uh, building up the team. I will say this, though, that the HR function is different to the HR team as such, in the sense that we have uh, we follow something called, it's along the lines of the Ulrich model of HR, which means that each of the core units or each of the core teams in the business has a representative in the HR function. So they're like employee champions, we call them lead links. Uh, so things like performance reviews are actually facilitated by senior people in each of those teams. So the when we look at the HR in our business, it's a working group, not just a function. So we have Lola, who kind of leads the strategic organizational development. We have Jen, who's the, the expert on the administration side of HR. We also have an outsourced facility a company we use in Kerry uh, called uh, HR. Um, Sweet. Yeah, really good outfit. And, and they help us with lots of the nuts and bolts and things like that. So I would recommend having that, especially Karen, to your point, even at less than 50 people, you could probably have a, an arrangement with somebody like that to help you through the kind of more nuts and bolts sides of, of HR. And they can be really, really um, good. And there's loads of them out there. I'm sure I'm not just picking one, but they're the guys we've used and we like them. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, the way we look at it is HR isn't just a, a function. It's it's something that we bring the other uh, team members into, you know, so how we communicate change. Our chief marketing officer is involved in that to make sure that we, we communicate well and that we don't undercook messages and things like that. And we have representatives from each of the kind of core groups in the business as well who are part of that. And they meet every month. OK, well, I'm, I'm nearly out of time, but I, I might just ask you, Karen, just for a final thing, that, that, that there's something in there that people want to know how they can avail of EI supports to help address organizational changes and, and, and I suppose get access to you, I think, is, is if I'm reading this correctly. Yeah, so I guess the first port of call is to connect in with your development advisor and just have a chat with them because they will, they have a wealth of knowledge that they can direct you to appropriate programs and supports. Um, if you're looking to sort of look more in depth um, into your organizational growth journey and what um, to assess maybe some of your, your needs. Um, absolutely, we and the people and management team can come in and really give a deep dive into your company to, to help you understand where your growth um, challenges might be and signpost you to support. Um, but your DA will be able to provide access to um, there's our Spotlight on Skills program, which is around helping you identify and address particular skills needs, attracting and retaining talent program, which going back to what Owen had said, is really around helping you develop an employee value proposition that's going to be compelling enough to attract and retain um, your staff. Um, we have a Go Global program, which is a strategic kind of organizational development program, which helps you build your organizational structure and strategy. And obviously, Owen, as Owen mentioned, our Leadership for Growth program. So there's a lot of supports there connecting with your development advisor in the first instance, and they'll be able to guide you. And um, they may well guide you to me and the team, and we'd be happy to support you looking in depth at your, your structures and your processes. Thanks, Karen. Much appreciated. Owen, there was a, a really nice question that came in there, um, uh, and I think he even uh, typed in a, an answer to it. But but uh, it's like you were talking about the evolution of the culture, the practices, your business as it's grown, um, you know, you know what, do, what? What is it? You, the thing that you do now that you wish you'd started out doing when you when you were a smaller team? Yeah, re really simply, I, I think I would have said there was start with the values. No, well, we hadn't really defined our core values as clearly as we have today. We were really clear on some things. You know, we were really clear on what kind of company we wanted to be, um, and, and you you have to stick to those values. So I think I think firstly defining what that is, defining the purpose of the organization. We did that really early on. And being really clear about what kind of company you want to be. And, and one of the things we said early days was we wouldn't make technical decisions for non-technical reasons, i.e. financial gain or pressure. Somebody trying to push us to do something that we didn't think was the right thing to do. Right. So mm -hmm. that evolved into doing the right thing. And we have we have a way of looking at that now. But I remember very early in the business when we were only three people, we were offered a, a role on a project with a client who immediately was a bad fit. Uh, it was obvious that they didn't really care about what we did and they didn't really care about doing things the right way and um, we felt there was a, the guy was a bit of a bully and the way he was speaking to the staff and everything else was terrible um, but it was a big job and, and we really needed the money um, but we I remember at that point turning down the work and telling the guy why he said look you, you've no interest you've no interest in doing things the right way we have no interest in working with you because you're not you're not our client right and um, Connell Finn who was our first uh, senior hire 
and David Bill Boyle, uh, who's our operations director now, they're both still with us. And I remember them saying at the time, well, that was a big call, you know, do we not need that money? I was thinking, we bloody do, you know. I ended up, <laughs> I ended up having to send a few personal items to pay staff, pay staff at one point in time. Uh, and I think the point here is that if you compromise on that stuff early, if as a leader in the company, even when it's small, if you're not living up to those values, you are you have to be the reflection of those things to the people around you. You have to really mean it and you have to be authentic about it. If you at any point in the journey, whether it's 12, 50, 100 people, if you renege on those values, then they're just they're just written words. It means nothing, right? And you don't need to be a big company to have clear values. That's easy, you know, just say what you mean and and, and live up to it. You know, I think that everything stems from there. And to this day, everything has stemmed from there. You know? Okay. Well, super. Well, look, I'm going to have to wrap it up there today. We're a little bit over on time. So I just want to say a huge thank you to both Karen and Owen. I, I really appreciate the time you, you spent here with us today. Uh, look, I hope you found the session useful and as interesting as I did. So just to say our next session will be on the 28th of June. It's the fourth in our Building for Scale series. Um, we will be discussing how a board can help uh, a company scale rapidly, uh, how you can recruit for it, how you build that effective board uh, at the various stages uh, on your growth journey. And I'm going to be joined by Helen Ryan, who is actually currently an EI board member, uh, but she's also a director on a number of boards uh, of rapidly growing companies such as Cree Valve and Blue Drop Medical. Um, you, some of you also remember that she was CEO of Cregana Medical and uh, she scaled that to become one of the largest indigenous medical uh, device companies in Ireland. So uh, I'll, then for my client company, we're going to be joined with Patrick Burns, the CEO of Crew Medical, a company that has over 180 skilled professionals dedicated to manufacturing orthopedic implants for the world's largest orthopedic companies. So again, thank you. Uh, and he's going to talk specifically about how the board has made a difference in, in his growing journey. So look, thank you again for joining us um, and to the team who all made this happen. And if you want to catch up with any of the previous sessions or, or rewatch this one, uh, please go to the EI website and it's our global ambition and it's the client solutions. Um, so thank you very much. And I will see you next month.